Also, if you were to take a moment, take the time to understand Dylan, you would pretty much snuff out this fear in town. If any of these people freaking out about Death Crunch, about Satanism, about deer being mutilated in the woods, and they found the person they were afraid of, and they talked to them, instead of just looking at them and pointing a finger, there's a good chance that this, all of this could have ended in a very different way. A much got, better way. It's got resonance that... And it applies to so many different, it's got so many different meanings as well. Yeah. It's a very kind of um, broadly uh, like applicable thing, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, it speaks as much to them as a family and him as a person as it does the themes of the show. Completely. This is like the satanic, this is like the version of satanic panic that people actually thought was happening. Yes. That never did. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, there's a lot of, well, the, the, the show is already like a cult classic, has an amazing <laughs> 80s feel, you know, that reminiscent to the, you know, the horror and thriller uh, shows from the movies from back then. Yeah. Were there any specific shows or movies that you took inspiration from? Yeah, I mean... I, I personally, when I first started pitching it, I was calling it Freaks and Geeks and Satanists. So it was supposed to be, you know, it's these teen kids plus this horror element to it. But on top of that, there's so much other stuff. I'm a huge fan of 80s horror. I'm a huge fan of, you know, maybe these didn't all totally make it into the show clearly, but like Reanimator, Evil Dead, um, uh, Fright Night. Anything in that kind of ballpark. I love the way 80s horror movies, movies, especially studio horror movies, just moved like a bullet. Like, the stories just had so much forward momentum. We wanted to try to bring that into the structure of our show. I don't know how many episodes you guys have seen, but once you hit the midpoint of the series, that ball is rolling down the hill, and it doesn't stop until the last frame. So that's that's kind of what we took from the eighties films. I don't know if you want to. Well, add those added scream is a is a is a sure. influence, and obviously Matt had prepared for the for the writing staff when we got the writers together, sort of a list of all those things that making sure and that we were familiar with all that stuff. Not only that, but a long reading list and documentaries with Satanic Panic yeah. and and books about that, and so that all of that was all already there in Matt's pilot, but then as as we developed the show, all of us were sort of uh, drawing from that same inspiration. And then our writing staff also is, yeah. is steeped in yeah. this stuff. So that was... I think a key to camp, like to writing and directing camp, is staying ahead of that camp and kind of keeping it under control mm -hmm. and being self-aware. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a line in the show, um, again, the, the show is honestly really full of what like just kind of stand out bits of dialogue that I, that I really resonated with. And, Thank you. Um, where you know, the Dylan's crush, Judith. Ju yeah. She says happy and hollow because you're you're kind of close while you're there. Yeah. Right. That's a great line. It's an amazing line, and I think that speaks. To, Jamie playing again. Oh, uh, Jamie playing. Oh yeah. yeah. It just speaks <laughs> to kind of layers, right? This is all very right. well thought out. This is all yes, it's campy, it's honoring these things, but it's also like it it knows what it is. Yeah. You know, I think it's trying to say something. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not a question. I don't know if there was a question there, but yeah, I would love to answer. Can, yeah. can I follow up what you said earlier? Yeah. Midpoint of the season, the, the show takes a dynamic shift in terms of its, its emotionality. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate more on like what the writing was like for that, knowing that you were going to go on this full-blown, less camp, more yeah. very dramatic journey towards yeah, the second Yeah, absolutely. Half? Well, we all knew what that midpoint episode was going to be. We essentially saw that as the second pilot. So there's the episode one that follows Dylan mostly, and then we knew there was always going to be one episode about Faith and what happened to her in that missing chunk of time. So we approached it as, essentially we're rebooting the show mid-season, and that's gonna sling us forward to the end. So what we learn about that, what we learn about Tracy there, what we learn about Faith and the Reverend and all of these characters, changes everything that we knew about them in those first four episodes so that we still there's still like I wouldn't call it camp but there's a tongue in a cheek for the rest of the show I mean there's still like jokes that are very much I mean keeping the levity there I think but yeah it was really exciting for us to have that moment fall where it did and just like put it on rails through the end of the season. And it, what it did also was all the high school stuff, the prom, the girl, the dating the girl, the band, the performance, 
all of that had to go in the first half of the season. So you end up with like this bifurcated se- uh, show where the first half is it's still horror, and there's still but there's all the great coming of age high school stuff, and then yeah. as Matt and that's how Matt would constantly sort of say in the writers' room, we have to get this stuff done in the first half because once we get to that midpoint. We're on a we're not on a train what, out of time. What we always used to say is it's fun until it's not. Right. <laughs> and hopefully it still is, but yeah. a different right. kind of fun. What do you yeah. what do you guys remember about that time period? You're probably you're a little younger than me, probably. But I didn't live in the eighties at all. Ever. I was born in ninety. <laughs> so. I remember Tipper Gore getting upset about uh, music yes. lyrics. And, and thinking that was ridiculous, and then understanding even I was a I was an adult in the '80s, so understanding that this is what every generation goes through. that some version of Satanic Panic existed for every generation because you had you have parents scared. What are my kids up to? We're going to blame something. But the media went a little nuts. 2020 had a bizarre story in '86 about that. Story. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like it was, yeah, it was hilarious. Anyone who has not had a chance to ask a question and want to squeeze one in. Yeah. What I think you guys do so brilliantly with the show is that you have these two generations of characters in there, yeah. but they're not in service of each other. They all have these still storylines. Yeah. What challenges and benefits does it bring to you and the writers who are writing for such a long time? I'm sure that they are really much that. That's a great question. I mean, being true, Matt, Matt, again, Matthew had done that in the pilot. You had adults, you had kids, and they're fully formed, but you just, the, the question you keep asking yourself is, how is this, how is this character going to react? What's the real response? Even in this fantastic world that we're creating, which has this bit of question of supernatural, supernatural elements, we, we needed everybody to react as if they were real people, and that was always the goal. Uh, I mean, that, yeah, absolutely all that, but also, you know, we have so many parent-child dynamics within the show. Oh, yeah. there, there, there was a challenge of trying to find, how are these all different? How are we not yes. all angsty teen, teens yeah. and worried right. adults right. And, and trying to find different ways to, to shape these characters right. so that it's not all just like generation versus generation? Yes. No one wants to see that. <laughs>